Hi everyone, I'm Emma Eggleston, Dean of the WVU School of Medicine Eastern Campus. So for tonight's mini med school, we have a real treat for you. We have Dr. Rosie Lorenzetti and Dr. Maddie Humerick taking us through the truths and myths about healthy snacking. They'll do so with a hands-on de demo showing you how to cook healthy snacks and based on lots of evidence-based advice. So Drs. Lorenzetti and Humerick will be joined by Kate Webster, who's one of our fourth year WVU medical students. So Kate is in our culinary lifestyle medicine track, learning all about how to teach patients about healthy food, exercise, sleep, and stress. And this really innovative track is led by Drs. Lorenzetti and Humerick. Kate is in her fourth year and about to graduate and start a an pediatrics residency. So thank you, Kate, Dr. Schumerick, and Lorenzetti. Well, hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to Mini Med School for April. And today we thought we would do something fun for you. We have a group here called the Med Chefs, which are medical students that are in a culinary and healthy exercise and eating and lifestyle track. And uh, we're gonna go through a couple different um, recipes for you today, and you may not be able to cook along with us right now, but maybe you'll be inspired to do at least one of these three. Uh, we're also gonna be having some Q and A's during this session um, to dispel some myths about snacking, healthy snacking. So I'm Dr. Rosie Canarella Lorenzetti. I'm Dr. Maddie Humer. I'm Kate Webster. And Kate is soon to be a doctor in one month. She graduates and she's part of this track. So we're going to start by doing a little knife demo and we're going to talk to you about uh, the recipes that we're going to do today. So one of the first things, and we also have a chef that works with us in all the classes that we do, Scott Anderson, he's a local guy. And most of the chef skills that we have, we have gleaned from Scott over the past six or seven years yeah, yeah. that we've been doing this. So one of the first things that he mentioned was, this is a super nice cutting board. It's got these rubber things that help anchor it. But if you don't have that kind of a cutting board, he suggests a wet towel underneath your cutting board so it doesn't slip. You could use a wet paper towel or you could use a wet dishcloth if you have that laid out underneath and then you can put any, we have the flimsy plastic ones too and it works really well with those. Perfect. We're, we're going to be tag teaming between the three of us this whole time so hopefully we won't make you too dizzy. Um, we're going to start uh, with making some egg frittatas. And even though that sounds like a breakfast meal, we use it as snacks, and we'll show you how we do that. So first we're gonna prepare our peppers and our onions and our spinach that are gonna go into these frittata muffins. Um, Chef Scott teaches us to use a really good sharp knife. If your knife is dull, it's more likely to, to waver, and you're more likely to hurt yourself. So with a really sharp knife, you're less likely. And the one thing with these peppers, they have these um, edges here. That's where the membrane is. So he taught us to sort of, you want to keep your tip of the knife on the board and come down at an angle. And what you end up getting is a slice without the membrane. So it just makes it a little easier when you're dicing to not have to worry about cutting the membrane. So now we're going to dice these up. We usually cut from the inside of the um, pepper because it's a little easier than the oftentimes waxed outside. As you can see, if she had put that rough side down, your knife might slip off the really slick part of the pepper. So that's why she's flipping it that way. You also see I'm kind of moving my fingers back and forth. A and moving the, uh, the knife is sort of staying stationary in the same place, but just the tip moving. And moving my fingers backwards. And the nice part while she's cutting that is that the rest of the pepper, you can throw the top into uh, your compost. So if you have a garden, you can save that. The bottoms, 
This is a really good piece of pepper. You could eat this. You, it, you could throw this into a soup or something that you, or even a stock that you might not necessarily need it to look pretty. So we do save the tips as well. You could also throw this into your skillet too, so you're not wasting any part of the pepper. So we learned that when you go to pick up your peppers, you want to use the non-sharp part of your knife. Some olive oil in the pan. Oh yeah. I forgot the most important step. Put the olive oil in the pan first. <laughs> so one thing is you want to get your pan hot then the olive oil hot, and then put in your vegetables. So she's sauteing the peppers and onions for your frittata right now. Next, we're going to cut the onion. Now, we've heard many things about how to not cry while you're cutting an onion. And probably the one that I've heard the best is to put it in the freezer before. But then you've got this onion that's kind of these little frozen particles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when you have a round object, one of the first things you want to do is cut off the bottom to make it flat. And then I'm going to cut right through this root. And the purpose of that is so that the onion will stay together when I cut it. Now, God made the onion smart. Because see these little lines here? You're going to cut right down those lines. So you're going to hold your onion, and I'm just going to go right down those lines. And then I'm going to dice it this way. And you can see the size of the chop that she made in the dice is how she wants to eat it. So if you're eating something with raw onion, you're going to want to make your little slices along the curves of the onion very thin, so that when you do your next chop, you're going to get really nice small pieces. With a frittata, you want your pieces about the same size as your pepper, so when you bite into your frittata, you get a nice chunk. And the other thing is we're cooking the onion, so you can have your diced onion a little bit larger. So we're just letting the onions and the peppers saute and get a little soft right now. Now, if you want to have frittatas, and you want your pieces bigger, then you can just do that too. And then you could end up with pieces that are a little bit bigger if you want, if that's what you want for the meal that you want. Works great in a salad, fajitas, anything with a larger slice of the onion. You can see if you just make long cuts of the onion and cut off your bulb at the end, you're gonna get those nice pieces that are just like little thin slices. And the next trick we're going to show you after uh, the onion is the frittata wants you to have some wilted spinach. For the sake of time and because we have a skillet in front of us, we're going to throw the spinach onto the skillet. But Dr. Lorenzetti has a nice trick that she learned with spinach and also Swiss chard. You could do it with that too. Mm -hmm. okay. So you could get a just nice hot cup of water and have your spinach. You could put it in a colander over your bowl. So if I had a little strainer, put my spinach in the strainer on top, and then just pour that hot water over. It'll instantly wilt it so you can use it right away in your frittata. But like I said, because we're using the saute pan, we're going to just throw spinach into the pan with the olive oil, peppers, and onions. We probably need a little trash bowl. Absolutely. One thing they talk about is a trash bowl and a treasure. So as Dr. Humerick said, this is the treasure because you're going to use this in a soup but you're not going to use these onion skins in the soup. So, uh, she just added the spinach. Um, they're all sautéing. And for a minute, while they're doing that, and you clean up this workspace, you want to talk a little bit about the olive oil? Sure. So, we used this um, olive oil in our dish at the beginning to saute. Um, olive oil is a great source of healthy fat um, and we recommend olive oil instead of things like vegetable oil or canola oil. Um, and so a little trick is on the back, on the label it'll tell where the olive oil is made, which country. And so this one that we used it says it's from Portugal. Mm -hmm. So just one country, whereas this one it has a long list of um, 
Italy, Greece, Spain, Argentina, a bunch of other ones. And so if you find olive oil that's just from one country, it's the purest from the country, whereas this one is kind of mixed from all the different countries. So we recommend just one country. Yep, high in omega-3s. The other thing we look for with an olive oil bottle is that it's green or tinted. So if olive oil is left to with light exposure, it'll actually start to go bad. So we always want to buy an olive oil um, that has that green tint to it, or just a, a tinted jar or bottle. Um, some of them at Walmart and some of the other stores might have a clear, but they also have the, the green ones that you can pick up. One other thing I wanted to talk about olive oil is that I've heard from patients that um, you can't saute or fry in it. Actually, olive oil, just good old plain olive oil, doesn't have to be extra virgin. You can saute in, it can go up to a higher temp. So it is safe to saute with which is why we use it in our pan today. Mm -hmm. If you're doing a dressing, you might want to use more of an extra virgin olive oil. It has a nice flavor mm -hmm. to it when you're having it on raw veggies. I actually had a patient last week tell me that in. one of his doctors told him um, not to use olive oil because it would clog up his arteries. And remember, one of the myths that we wanted to dispel today is fat doesn't make us fat, and fat doesn't clog, clog our arteries inflammation does. And you'll see here as we talk a little bit more about the cookies, where a lot of the inflammation comes in the American diet is from um, oils that are made from like corn oil, vegetable oil. They have a lot more of the inflammatory types of products in them as do olive oil. So that's why we really push olive oil, canola oil, mm -hmm. uh, avocado oil. Yep. Anything else that you guys? Not so much sunflower oil because it has a little more of the omega-6s in it. Mm -hmm. And if you look at a lot of commercial products, even everything from crackers to store-bought salad dressings, they almost always have soybean oil and vegetable oil. So you want to be looking on your labels for canola and olive. All okay, right. so I this think looks great. we're about ready to uh, really good. put that in there. So one of the tricks that we learned with these, um, these are actually rather large muffin tins. You can certainly use a smaller one. But we learned about putting the vegetables, we want to move the olive oil yep, Moving it. the, uh, putting the vegetables in the muffin tin as your base. So we call these frittatas, and people are used to frittatas being something that you would make in the oven. And these are going to go in the oven, but they're not going to go in a big pan. These little muffin tins are really awesome because once you prepare a dozen, you might only feel like eating two or four of them, and the rest of them can be frozen and then can be taken out later to be put into um, a microwave at work as your afternoon snack. So that's why we kind of think of these as a snack, especially with the shape of the uh, muffin. You kind of feel like you're eating a brand muffin. Yep, easy to pack for work in a Ziploc bag. Um, and it's a nice size too, so you control your portion size because it's in the shape of a muffin, which is great. And the other thing we want to talk about today are eggs. I feel like there's a lot of controversy around eggs. We love eggs. They are low in carbohydrates. They have amazing amounts of protein and healthy fat. Uh, so we tend to use eggs a lot. Um, and we have a bunch already whipped up here that are gonna go into our frittata. So we do not think eggs are bad for you or clog your heart. Uh, we think just in moderation like everything else. So we're gonna show you how these eggs turn out too. Um, also in this egg mixture, we also can use some half and half or some milk whole milk, and this is whole milk uh, feta cheese and whole milk parmesan. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Humerick can be talking about why those are what we believe about whole milk. So a lot of people in recipes will say use low fat dairy, things like that. But when we're using dairy products, we love whole fat because it makes people feel full. The taste is great, so you can eat a little bit less of it and get great flavor. And also, there are some healthy properties to dairy fat. So they contain great um, energy for the body, and they're not necessarily bad for you as long as you eat dairy in moderation. 
So that's why we like to use it in our recipes. Um, again, I'd rather you have a flavorful, uh, flavorful food that's healthy for you uh, than to eat more of a low-fat product. Oftentimes when you take the fat out of a dairy product, mm -hmm. which is fat is satiating, right? When you take the fat out, um, a lot of products like yogurt, for example, would then add back in carbohydrates. And we're going to be talking about why some of those carbohydrates are not so good for you. Yeah. So now we're just going to do a little bit of our feta. Other great thing is you'll see in this recipe, we're not adding salt. And that's because the dairy, the feta cheese, and the Parmesan cheese has a great uh, saltiness to it. So you don't have to add a lot of salt to your recipes. So this is great for people with diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, heart failure. Um, so you do not have to steer away from, um, from these if you have those conditions. And we're going to top it off with this little bit of Parmesan. And that will give it that nice little crust. It almost kind of get, gets like a little crust on top kind of like how you would get with a pizza. The other thing about Parmesan is you'll notice we didn't put any meat in these frittatas. And Parmesan is one of the products that gives you the umami flavor. Umami is that meaty, savory flavor that when you have a product that you're making that doesn't include meat will give it that savory taste. So they're ready now to go into the oven, and this is how they look. And we're going to show you in a little bit how they look when they come out. We just top it with a little oregano. Yeah, as well. we're not going to. I can't move it too much, or all the eggs will come <laughs> running out all don't, over don't, the table. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Okay. So right. Kate, if you want to put that in. Okay. I'll clear the station here. The next thing we want to show you is a one bowl chocolate chip cookie. And you might think, wait a minute, why are doctors going to show us how to make a cookie? Well, there's a twist. This is gonna be a low carbohydrate chocolate chip cookie. It's one of Dr. Lorenzetti's favorites. And we'll tell you why uh, we love this recipe in just a second. We're gonna pull it up here, all the ingredients. So one of our myths was diabetics can't have sweets. And obviously, the answer to that is, that's not true. You can't. They have to be mindful of their carbohydrate when they're eating a sweet snack. So one of the things that we're going to do today is show you how to choose some lower carb choices to make a snack, or what we would consider a very healthy carb choice, like oatmeal, to make a snack. All right. Okay, why don't we talk about each ingredient? Yep. So this recipe is pretty simple. We've already preheated the oven to 325. Um, you just want to line a baking sheet with parchment paper if you have it, or you can use your Pam. Um, and then in a bowl, we're actually going to stir up together the egg and our sugar. And in this case, if we have a diabetic patient, we tend to ask them to use a, a substitute sweetener. So I do not like the alternative sweeteners like aspartame and Splenda, the artificial sweeteners that can affect gut bacteria um, and really cause a lot of GI symptoms for our patients. So I have a lot of patients with irritable bowel syndrome from drinking a lot of soda with Splenda and aspartame in it or eating products with Splenda because it's everywhere. So instead, we'll say to go to a substitute like allulose. I know this says Splenda at the top, but this is actually allulose which you can find at Walmart, that's where I got this one. We like uh, stevia that has a little bit of erythritol in it or monk fruit sweetener. Monk fruit's actually nice. Some of them have a brown sugary flavor. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just processed where they pull the sugar out of that and it's a, a non-sugar sweetener. So it won't raise your blood sugar. So all three of those, allulose, um, the stevia and the monk fruit will not raise your blood sugar. They're, they're made from plants, mm -hmm. not in a laboratory. So if you really want something sweet and you are craving something, we'll usually tell our diabetic patients, we'll try this out. If you like it, then you can have a little bit of it and it really satisfies your taste for that sweet. One thing a lot of people will say, how about agave? Mm -hmm. But products like agave and molasses, they still have as much sugar mm -hmm. effect on your blood sugar if you're a diabetic as regular sugar. Mm -hmm. But you will see in one of our recipes um, certainly for a child to have a healthy snack, right. you don't need to use a sugar sweetener for that. 
And honey, even though it has the same carbs as sugar, at least it has some medicinal benefits to honey. So we do tend to make a lot of things with honey as well. So for kids, you know, you'll see a lot of recipes with honey or maple syrup. Just keep in mind, if you do have diabetes, those are still going to raise your blood sugar. All right, so let's go ahead. What we're going to want to do is whip together the egg and the sugar substitute, and then we're going to add the coconut and vanilla. I already put the vanilla in the egg, so you don't have to do that. Here's the other trick with these sweeteners. It says on here one to one, do not put in, <laughs> if it says one cup sugar, do not put in a cup of allulose. You will spit it out. It is so sickeningly sweet. I think for this recipe, we only used about a tablespoon, if yeah, that. Like one sixth of the amount. The, here, right. Kate, remember how okay. we made it just yeah. a little bit? <laughs> you can really mess up your recipe if we use, and I always say go to taste. If it's too much, or you can always add more, so just add less. More? Maybe a little more. <laughs> Maybe a little more. Okay, so we're going to whisk that together. I think I put my spoon over here. Here, we can use this one. All right, another one. All right. And the next thing we're going to use is almond flour. So the alternative flours we use tend to be the nut flours because they're low carbohydrate. Keep in mind they still have a little bit of carbs, but compared to flour, you're going to get uh, way less carbohydrates with something like this. Coconut flour is another one um, that we like. So those are very low carb. Um, and they have great omega-3 fatty acids. So when we talk about healthy fat, this is another one of those that has a lot of healthy fat in it. So instead of so wheat this is our flour, flour it, has, baking soda. it has the protein and the healthy fat. The almond flour is just literally ground up almonds. Um, but one thing is it doesn't stick together because there's no gluten mm -hmm. like it would be in a wheat flour. So to be honest, you can't just take your favorite recipe and just substitute almond flour because it won't turn out the same. So you do have to Google an almond flour recipe and this is specifically an almond flour recipe. Mm -hmm. And we certainly can put these recipes on the Facebook for those of you that want to make these later. Mm -hmm. There's also, we use a lot of coconut flour also, but coconut flour is very absorbent and really sucks in the liquid. So it's, I don't have any recipes that are just coconut flour. Right. Usually you would use coconut flour and almond flour mm -hmm. in smaller amounts. And we just added some uh, coconut oil. So I just melted down the coconut because it does come, it's solid at room temperature. I melted that. You could also use some canola in this recipe if you don't like the flavor of the coconut. And then our last two ingredients are going to be just some chopped nuts. The great thing about this recipe, if you don't like nuts, you don't have to include nuts, just like you would in your normal chocolate chip. But we had some almonds that were hanging around, so I'm just going to add those in. And then chocolate chips. Um, these are just normal chocolate chips. These are great for kids and things like that, people that don't have diabetes. However, um, if you do have diabetes, we love the Lily's uh, sugar-free chocolate chips. They have awesome flavor, and they're usually made with stevia. And I like, like the 60% dark cocoa yeah. chocolate chips, because again, they only have about five carbs per serving. So um, the higher the, the percentage of cocoa, the better off you are. You're going to have a lot less carbohydrate. This is a good chance for us to talk for a second about good carbs versus bad carbs. So bad carbs are carbs that are highly refined. Therefore, example, uh, even whole wheat flour is a refined flour. Whereas these almond flours literally are almonds that you can stick in a Vitamix and spin them up. It's just pure nuts. So um, a lot of the refined carbs are the ones like, you know, the average spaghetti, ramen noodles, mm -hmm. which is a yeah. big favorite for a lot of people. Uh, Lucky Charms, I noticed they just got recalled. They had some, they oh. had some bad, something bad in the Lucky Charms I saw it on TV. <laughs> and then oatmeal cookies in a package. Whereas natural good carbs are the carbs that you would find in, a, in an apple or carbs that you would find in oatmeal and some vegetables and beans. Even, there are even carbs in peanut butter and um, dairy products, but all of those carbs would be considered good carbs. Ooh, looking good, Kate. Yep. In a second, we're going to show you what the finished product looks like. <laughs> The, the, the other interesting thing about almond flour is you know how normally when you make it a chocolate chip cookie, you roll it in your hand, you make like a little ball, and you put it down, and then it flattens when it cooks. These aren't going to do that. 
So however big, Kate, you want to show them how, how big you're making them? Sure. That, that's as big ball. as the cookie's going to be. Yeah. yeah. So it's if like you a want golf ball size. But they're, but they're more flat because they're not going to flatten yep. on their own. Yep. Um, so she can make it as big. Now, they're, we make them small mm -hmm. because they're nutrient-dense cookies. So when you think about a cookie, um, what is it? At some of the commercial places, a cookie might be as Huge. big as yeah. the big palm of your mm -hmm. hand, right? And it's made with refined flour. These cookies are very nutrient-dense because this got egg, protein, fat. Mm -hmm. So we tend to make them a lot smaller because they are going to be filling. Right, they're mm -hmm. higher in calories. So you could pack two of these for your afternoon snack and you'd be, you'd be good. This is going to be filling. That's really good. I'm going to bring over. Can we show them the finished frittatas? Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to show you our frittatas as they're done. They have amazing color. You can use whatever color bell peppers you want in the recipe. We chopped green up for you earlier in the demo, but you could also chop up red. And you can see the green, red color and how nice the spices make the tops look so they get really nice and golden. And they're perfect snack size, so you could have one or two and these are going to be really filling. Looks really nice, Kate. So what we'll do, we'll pull these cookies. We're also going to show you the finished cookie. So the cookies turn out like they, like she said, it's in the shape that you roll them. So if you have little bite size, then this is how they're going to come out. Again, you could pack up two um, and take in your lunch for an afternoon snack, and it's great for kids. And our last recipe we want to show you is going to be our protein bites. These are some of our favorites because you can literally pull out anything you have in your pantry to put in these protein bites. So uh, Chef Scott, this is one of his favorites that he showed us. If you have any oats, leftover oatmeal, you can throw that in here. So, and the great thing is you can't mess this recipe up. You really just throw in the ball. So we've got oats here. Any chopped nuts you had, we had almond, you could use pecan, walnuts, anything you like. Coconut flakes. These are great because they have a lot of healthy fat as well. Coconut can be a little controversial. Um, there's debate whether, you know, coconut is healthy for you or not. It is a saturated fat, but there's also healthy fat inside the coconut too. So in moderation, we do tend to use it. It's also filling. It has a lot of fiber in the coconut, especially if you use a flake like this. All right. We had some leftover raisins in the pantry, so we threw those in. You could use dried cranberries. You could use figs that are cut up, apricots, anything Date, you have. Yeah. Dates, yeah. Or you could leave them out. Mm-hmm. This is sort of an all-for-anything kind of cookie. Mm -hmm. This is another alternative flour or meal that we love. It's flaxseed meal. What's great about it is flax seeds are super high in omega-3s, and we can use it in a binder. So if you were making a breaded fish, like we love almond and flax and crusted fish, use almond flour. The flaxseed meal gives you a little bit of uh, crunchiness to your co coating. Um, so this is a nice binder that you can throw in that's low carb and high in omega-3s. So we're just going to dump that in there. It's also, there's something called a flax egg. So people with egg allergies, you can take some dry flax and add some water. Uh, and the proportion, I think, is one tablespoon of flax to three tablespoons of mm -hmm. water. Yep. And you let it sit for about five to ten minutes and it gets kind of jelly and or gooey and then that becomes the egg in the recipe. So a lot of people that uh, like to eat uh, in a vegan style, they'll use flaxseed eggs instead of real eggs, or egg allergies, you could use a flax egg. Again, chocolate chips, you could use the lilies if you want to go uh, less sugar, or you could use regular, especially with kids. This is a great kid recipe. They love to get in there and use their hands and mash these up. Um, and then a lot of peanut butter. You kind of need to, when you put your peanut butter in, as you start to roll your balls, you might need less or more peanut butter. Um, if you get a little bit too moist and you're not able to form the balls, then you might need to add more oatmeal or flaxseed meal. And then the last thing is whatever sweetener you want. So again, if you have someone in the family with diabetes or prediabetes, I would go maybe with a allulose or a monk fruit sweetener or something like that. Uh, if you just are doing this for the kids instead of a store-bought cookie, you can go ahead and throw in honey or maple syrup really tastes nice in these. 
So we just had some leftover maple syrup that I'm going to drizzle in. I made these just um, this weekend with my two and a half year old. And the same thing happened. We had the honey upside down. She said, very slow. But the, she could do this whole thing herself. Um, mm -hmm. And they love to mix things. Yes. And um, we're going to make them into balls mm -hmm. here. But at home, I have these muffin tins that are about the size of a peach pit. And, we, and that was real easy for her to fill each little muffin hole uh, with the mixture. This is coming really slowly. <laughs> really, this is slow hands. Thing. But you really don't need a lot. That's what's nice because the chocolate chips and the raisins, or if you use cranberries, give it some sweetness or apricots. So I don't like to use a lot of sugar in mine. You really don't need it, especially with the chocolate chips mm -hmm. and the raisins. You just don't need, sometimes it just helps to, to bind it. So I'm going to grab some gloves and help mix this up. The other um, thing is, you know, oatmeal is one of those ones that we called a good carb, right? Because for some, um, for a patient with diabetes, sometimes their blood sugar will go up with carbohydrates. That's one of the values of sort of those continuous glucose monitors. You could kind of figure that out for yourself if your blood sugar is going to go up with the um, oatmeal. But we tend to use the slow cook oatmeal. The one thing about the oatmeal and the peanut butter is this is now a complete protein because peanut butter is a legume, oatmeal is a grain. So when you mix the low oat, I'm saying I don't let the kids do this. It's not my. I don't like it. In my hands. Oh, this. the kids love <laughs> but it. My son and my daughter love this. They feel like they're playing in the sand. <laughs> they, they do. Feel like they're playing in the sand. But now this is also a treat for your child that at least is a complete protein. It's not just a complete sugar mess. The other thing we should say and mention here is that it is so important to get your kids in the kitchen with you. Number one, because it helps when they get a little older, they can cook for you, which is great when you're really tired. But also we know that kids that cook in the kitchen with you, they will start to eat healthier. So if you get your kids involved in actually chopping the vegetables, making the food that you cook, I hear a lot, you know, parents will say, oh, they won't eat that. They're really picky. One way to get, a, get at that is to get them in the kitchen with you, have them cook it. They are so proud when whatever that dish is comes out, they want to taste it and they get excited about food. So the best thing you can do is get them in the kitchen um, and you'll be surprised at how much they actually will eat and don't make a big deal about it. If you make something green, who cares? Just let them taste it. Um, and they usually will. It's pretty surprising. I think this is coming out good. Mm -hmm. So this, <clears throat> this talk was supposed to be about snacks, healthy snacks. And for sake of time, we're not going to make hummus with you, which is another thing we love to do. Mm -hmm. It's super easy, just getting some chickpeas and putting them in the food processor. And we can include that recipe on the, on the Facebook. Um, one of the things that patients with diabetes, diabetes often tell me is that some doctor told them that they couldn't have carrots because they were too high in sugar. Mm -hmm. And I looked this up, and you have to eat one pound of carrots to equal the sugar in one bagel. So if you, nobody <laughs> eats a carrots. pound of carrots, <laughs> so I would say if carrots and a little bit of hummus makes a healthy snack for you, then you go right ahead and yes. eat that carrot. If you eat a pound of pear carrots, God bless you, because you probably won't eat anything else the rest of the day. So these are, um, you can see they do take a little bit of time to roll up, but again, get the kids involved. They will love this. And when you're done, you can stick them in the fridge and they'll start to harden up. The great thing is that these keep for a long time in the fridge as well, so you can pull them out as you go through the week. You could freeze these as well for a healthy snack. So then your kids can reach for this in the fridge instead of that unhealthy stuff we all keep in the pantry. So if you are a patient with diabetes, I'd probably leave out the raisins. Mm -hmm. So we know that dried fruit has more carbohydrate than fresh fruit, right? Yeah. And we know berries are the least carbohydrate heavy of the fruits. And then it goes to apple, kiwi, and oranges. And then it ends up with the tropical fruits like pineapple, bananas, and mango. So if you're trying to restrict carbs, we usually suggest the patient stick to berries, mm -hmm. but there's no reason why a healthy five-year-old could, kid couldn't have a few raisins in his cookie. Right. All right. 
So this is the point where we'd love to take questions from you guys, because normally we do this in person, and there's always 50 people that have their hand up. So we can't do that today, but I guess you could feel free to uh, email us. We can include yeah. our, our ad email addresses on the Facebook if they mm -hmm. really had some questions for us. Yep. And uh, Kate is going to be a pediatrician. She's going to start her pediatri pediatrics um, learning or residency yep. mm -hmm. in this two summer. months. Yep. 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 And She's doing right? a cooking class tomorrow afternoon for the for kids, kids. Yeah. at one of the local elementary schools around here. So yep. we're excited to have her around. Yep, it's been fun. So, um, so and you could comment too on the Facebook page if you have any um, any things you guys would like to see from us, recipes you're curious about, facts you're curious about food. So just let us know. All right. Well, thank you for having us, you all. Enjoy.